General John Shalakashvili is uh, a Peoria native who uh, commanded all NATO forces. He retired as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1997. We're talking on the eve of his being inducted into the Lincoln Academy of Illinois in general. It's very good to meet you. I'd like to begin with uh, some of the early years. Um, how, did you, uh, how did you come to be in Peoria? Gosh, it's a, it's, it's a really a long story. And, um, we were living in Europe after the war, and my parents had decided to, uh, that uh, I think probably for the sake of the children, uh, the right thing to do would be to try to immigrate to the United States where we would have a better chance than what looked like uh, at that time in the a, in a late 40s, early 50s in Europe. And so through a, a distant relative in Peoria, Illinois, uh, we happened in, uh, in the early winter of 1952, come to the United States and, and, and come to Peoria. How old were you then? I was 16 years old then. 16. I, uh, so when we arrived, uh, I had still a year and a half to go in, uh, in uh, high school, mm -hmm. Peoria High, which is a, was absolutely fantastic experience and, and a super way to get acclimated to, for a teenager to get acclimated to the United States. And then went on to Bradley, and finished Bradley in Peoria. What was it like moving from Europe to, uh, to well, middle America at that time, the transition? I don't know. I've, I have so many emotions about it. Probably the thing that strikes me the most is uh, that it was exciting. Uh, it was more exciting than anything that you could have ever read about in magazines or seen on TV screens about the United States. Um, although I must tell you, I, I don't ever recall ever reading anything or seeing anything on, on, uh, on uh, movie screens about uh, Peoria, Illinois. I was never disappointed by it after I got here. It was just, it was a very, first of all, a very different life. Um, but I could not have asked for anything better. It, it, was, it was just the right place to, uh, to start a new life. It's often said about the sense of values that you only have in a place like Middle America. And Peoria in the 1950s, early 1950s, was, was just that. And so, uh, whether you're talking about developing a sense of right or wrong or a sense of, of responsibility to the community, and whatnot, uh, you couldn't have picked a better place to, to grow up. I was going to ask about that. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a town that is pretty much representative of the United States. They say, well, if it'll play in Peoria, sure. then it'll play anywhere. Yeah. Uh, what about those values that, that, that you, uh, you, you, you mm -hmm. came across and started to mm -hmm. assimilate and everything? What, was, uh, what are some of the things that you think stood out and helped you in a very distinguished career? Well, I think uh, uh, life, first of all, is probably fairly conservative, in this, or at least was in the 50s in a place like Peoria. Um, so you learned uh, self-discipline. You learned right and wrong. Uh, you uh, learned to, uh, the value of religion. You learned the value of, of uh, hard work. Uh, there was never any question whether, as I was growing up then in Peoria, whether you would have a summer job or whether you would have a job after hours in, in school. Uh, you also learned an awful lot about the country. And uh, again, I really can't think of a better place to learn about what America is all about and what the responsibilities of an American uh, are in, in, in this society. And uh, it's those things probably that have stayed with me and have formed a foundation for my life more than anything else that I can think of. What in your experience or in your family's experience led you to a career in the military? Well, it was uh, a kind of an accident, a fortuitous accident. That I had finished Bradley and I uh, was about to go to work as a young design engineer when I received my draft notice. And so I um, I don't know how to say it. I went very reluctantly, and I was convinced that I was going to put in my two years in return again. And I, well, obviously, I did, I, I did not. Thirty-nine years later, I, I finally retired. Um, but it wasn't that. It wasn't that something that that immediately struck me as uh, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I I went in as a soldier. Eventually, was went to OCS at Officer Candidate School and was commissioned. And my first tour as an officer was up in Alaska. 
and it is there uh, that I really fell in love with that life. We played hard, we worked hard, uh, and I said, if that's what military life is all about, and, and uh, being with other young men and women, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to do. And I've never had a regret, never. What time period is this? This is the mid-50s now? Yeah, I uh, graduated from Bradley in, uh, in 58. And so uh, by July of uh, 58, I was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, going through my basic training. What area did you specialize in first in the military? Uh, you said you came out as an engineer from college? I, uh, I became an artilleryman. And I, uh, the military has mysterious ways in selecting <laughs> for these things that, that I don't always understand. But you go through various tests and so on, and someone decided that maybe because of my math training and as an engineer that I, would, I should go in the artillery. I did, and I, uh, again, it turned out to be absolutely the right thing for me. From Alaska, wh where did you go? Uh, I stayed there for about a year and a half or two years, two and a half years uh, in Alaska, and then left and was assigned to Fort Bliss in Texas, mm -hmm. uh, where, again, I, I stayed for a few years. But, and since then, it, it's, been a, it's been an extraordinarily exciting place. I mean, I, I've had a chance to serve in places from Korea to Belgium to Italy to Germany to uh, Vietnam, of course, as everyone in my generation had. And uh, um, I, uh, I could not have asked for, for a more versatile, exciting life. And what, is, what to me has always appealed so much is that, uh, I guess like someone who teaches at a school, the soldiers always stay the same age. They're all in the 18, 19, 20-year-old category, and although you grow older, the people that you work with, the majority of the people you work with, always stay young. And that forces you to kind of stay young at heart and, and uh, work extra hard to, to remain young. And, and I found that to be not only challenging, but also that's what attracted me as much as anything, I think. Well, you're a teacher, you're a mentor, and a leader at the same time. In a way, you sure are. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go and talk a little bit about your Vietnam experience. What was your service there like? Uh, it was uh, in the um, in the late '60s, around '68, '69, that time frame, uh, at the time of uh, the Tet Offensive, when it when it looked very bad for us. One of the one of my the things that I took out of, of Vietnam was that uh, you have to be very careful that you don't generalize uh, about what conditions are in a place like Vietnam. I think you were competent to say what conditions were where you were at any given time. And I happen to have been up north and uh, close to DMZ. So I can describe to you in great detail what it was like. What it was like in the rest of the country, I know from the same news accounts and news stories that everyone else knows about. Uh, in my sector, uh, the Tet Offensive was a devastating, uh, had a devastating impact on the South Vietnamese, on the United States, uh, a city in the northern part, their way that was overrun totally by, by, uh, by the North Vietnamese. Um, and it was probably one of the places uh, that was very much in a, on, on the news pages here and on, on the TV screens that had as much an impact on changing the opinion in the United States about, about that conflict there and our involvement there as, as any place, maybe Saigon a little more so than Wei, but Wei was certainly one of those key places. Uh, nevertheless, I, when I came back in, in the fall of 69, um, things had turned around sufficiently that I would have told you that things are really going very well. And it was only when I returned to the United States and, and began to understand the, the mood swing that had occurred here that I knew that things were not going well and that obviously the only place this was going to end was at some negotiating table. What was that like for someone who had taken on the Army mm -hmm. as, a, as a career and believed in the institution? I, it had a very traumatic effect. It's not just what was happening in Vietnam, which was in itself a, a, a very key uh, aspect of it, but it was what Vietnam was doing to the military service and my service 
particularly than the, than the Army. Uh, I don't think it's overstating it when I said that it was destroying the Army. By the time we got to uh, the early 70s, the Army was at a slower point as, as you ought to allow a military force to get. And many people were leaving in droves. And uh, I, I don't think any one of us at my age then who didn't go through a deep soul searching whether we not to stay or just leave and, and, and leave that all behind. And, and fortunately, a number of us decided we're going to stay and see if we can do something about it. Uh, we were naive enough to think that we were either enough advanced in age or in rank that we could do something. But we figured if we, if we stayed with it, stayed with it long enough, in time we could make a difference. Although I would be surprised if many of us in those days thought that it would take less than, than a couple decades or maybe even more. Uh, and what a surprise it was when really in a decade or almost less that, that you know, that the things that turned around totally, but not but not without some extraordinary hard work and, and, and some uh, gutsy decision on a part of, of a lot of leaders that we have to make very fundamental changes, that, that you weren't going to change this by incrementally, you know, fooling around here on the edges of, of, of the problem. You really had to make fundamental changes in, in the way we thought of our military, the way we recruited, the way we trained, the way we organized and equipped ourselves. So. Uh, one of the great lessons for us then was that if you're going to make a reform, it has to be an all-inclusive reform. Otherwise, you, you, you just, uh, you're not maximizing mm -hmm. uh, the gains that you could possibly have. What was the, what was the fundamental sea change that, that took place uh, in, in, in the Army, in the military, that, uh, that made that transition successful? I don't know which is more important, but I'll, I'll, let me just tick off a few things that come to mind when you ask that question. One was that we, we realized that we had, to, we had to get out of the draft and we had to get to a volunteer force. It wasn't immediately clear, but, but as we were thinking about those issues, it, it, it did in fact very early on strike us that we had to make those changes. The second thing was that we really had lost I don't know, the, the, the competence, our competence as a military force. And so we recognized we had to fundamentally change the way we trained our soldiers and m almost more importantly our leaders. So they in fact were the most competent war fighters that we could create. And that we had to put them under great pressure and that they had to perform and that, that no rank excused you from having to pass through a rite of passage, if you wish, a test that you really knew your business. Uh, so we revamped all of our schooling. We, uh, we began to concentrate on the core aspect of our business, which is leading men and women in war. In essence, fighting and winning this nation's wars. Uh, and that is easier said than done. And finally, I think, uh, something that we had absolutely no control over. Um, but I have to give a tremendous amount of credit to, uh, to President Reagan. Uh, when he came, it, it, was a, it changed the mood in the country. And all of a sudden, it was OK again to wear a uniform at an airport when you went somewhere. Uh, so, you know, people all of a sudden would pat you on the back uh, when they knew that you were in the military. And maybe that was the most important thing, the, the change that occurred when, when, uh, when he came. Where were you when Reagan took office? No, I think I was in Europe at that time. You were in NATO at that point? Yeah. Uh, not in NATO. I was in a U.S. unit in, the, in Europe um, where we sensed that, was, uh, that the change was occurring and occurring much quicker than we thought was in, 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 in the public's perception of uh, that it's all right to feel good about your country, that it's all right to feel good about your, about your military. But we also began, of course, shortly thereafter to see it in the amount of uh, spare parts we were getting and the new equipment that was arriving and, and the money that was made available to fix up the barracks and, and, and whatnot for the, for the troops. So it was, uh, it was a much deeper change that he brought about uh, and uh, 
than, than just, you know, uh, the feel good about yourself. But feeling good about your country was an important prerequisite to all the other things falling in place. Being in Europe at that time with uh, the Warsaw Pact and the former Soviet Union and the levels of strength that they had, the Cold War we are now learning after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, was in a very desperate spot at that time, particularly around 83, 84. Uh, it was a lot more dangerous perhaps than uh, many in the public knew. Give us a sense from, from where you were in, in, in Europe at that time how close we were to going to war? Well, I think uh, uh, we were probably closer than the public realized, but only in a sense that, that any miscalculation, mm -hmm. uh, any, any sort of uh, trouble on a, on a, in the German border could have taken us to war. What was troublesome was that I don't think the country realized that had it come to war, either deliberately or by accident, uh, that we were worse off uh, in those years in the, uh, than the public realized. And if you recall, it's really for that reason that the United States in those days always refused to rule out the first use of nuclear weapons because that was the, the sort of the final deterrent we had. Had we forsworn that, as some urged us, uh, I will tell you, uh, there, were, there was nothing preordained that we would have won uh, on the plains of, of, of Germany. Um, and uh, so I, probably the, the more worrisome wor uh, aspect of it was that there wasn't a cl clear realization uh, that, that we were not certain that we could, that in a conventional conflict with the Soviet Union, we could come out victorious. And it was not something that you wanted to have a great public debate about, obviously. Right. Uh, we had, what had happened to us was that uh, when the decision was made to get fully involved in, in Vietnam, without increasing the draft greatly, without calling up uh, the Guard and Reserve in any great numbers, uh, the majority of the people to support the war in Vietnam came from Europe. And so units that normally would have a lieutenant colonel and two or three majors and whole host of captains and then ended up being commanded by captains and maybe one or two lieutenants and sergeants and vastly undermanned. And uh, it, you know, it, it was just, we've never experienced anything like that in our history, but, but Europe was gutted in order to, to support the war in, in Vietnam. Furthermore, we went into Vietnam and uh, during that period, no money went into maintaining the capability that you needed to engage a modern, sophisticated, armored threat from, from the Soviet Union. Whatever money went into research and development went to help us deal with a totally different problem, a light force operating in the jungles and rice paddies of Vietnam. So we had this whole period of the Vietnam War where we neglected not only the manning of our forces in, in Europe, but also the equipping and keeping up with the latest developments in tank warfare that the Soviet Union was undergoing. So uh, it, it was a fairly, fairly iffy situation. I'd like to ask you, uh, you were talking about we never ruled out the possibility of a first strike or a preemptive mm -hmm. strike because of the strategic advantage the Soviets had by sheer weight of numbers on the ground and, and our, our, our relative weakness vis a vis that. Um, as a general, you can look at it one way from strategy, but as a family man, as a man who's concerned about the people in that area, what were your thoughts on that, having, having to possibly well, play that card? Well, well, I think it was the greatest assurance we had that we would never have to. You see, if you, the two ways to think of nuclear weapons as a war fighting kind of tool, and that to me is, you know, the least utility of that. But as a deterrent, if your interest is in fact to try to ensure that you never have to fight, then you want to be able to, you have to be able to deter, and it has to be a credible deterrent. And so you don't want to be forced into it 
of having to use them because you were not clear what you were willing to do to prevent it from happening. And so in that, that sense, uh, I supported, and I support to this day, that what had been done in those days, that, that you, had to, you had to have a declaratory policy that you were going to use them if, if, as, as a first, the first one to use it if it became necessary and if the, if it, if the loss of Europe uh, became a possibility. And by having done so, I, you never know why deterrence works. But I think that, uh, in retrospect, it worked. Were you surprised at the speed with which the former Soviet Union came apart and the Warsaw Pact countries started going their own way? Oh, absolutely. I, I think uh, there might be some people now who can tell you, yes, we can foresee this. I don't think anyone foresaw that. I don't think pe serious people who have dealt with those issues saw that coming and uh, had the vaguest notion that it would come that quickly. As a matter of fact, most people in those days, in the in a 80s, late 80s even, when you would talk to them, uh, would still tell you that, yeah, the day will come, but probably not in my lifetime. Were you in charge of NATO at that point? No, I was not. I was uh, in uh, 89, uh, I was the deputy commander in, uh, in Europe, and then uh, came back to Washington and became Colin Powell's assistant when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for a while and then went back to Europe in uh, 92, I think, uh, and, and became a Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. The reason, the reason I'm curious about that is um, with that sort of destabilization and uh, those kinds of mechanized forces and the Soviet nuclear force and being broken up and a bunch of independent players. What were, what was our military thinking at that point about what what the scenarios might have been? Well, people were training very hard, and people were very much concerned about it. Um, we uh, it was by that time uh, that we had already been the beneficiaries of of the resources made available the military, and we were going full speed in, in rearming ourselves, in uh, making sure that new airplanes would come on board, new tanks, armored personnel, carrier ships. Our training by that time uh, was well along in, in uh, which, what is probably today the, the premier training of any military in the world. I, mean, I, I have absolutely no doubt that if anyone in the world out there wants to really know how to train a military for war fighting, they will come to the United States. If you want to know how to conduct armored warfare, you don't go to any other country, but you come to a place like Fort Hood, Texas, where we, where we do that. If you want to know about how to conduct a similar air combat, you come to the United States, you go to Nellis Combat Ranges and learn them. Where else would you go to find out about how carrier battle groups operate? We have become, we have become uh, and have remained since Desert Storm the premier military force. And while we have problems that we need to address and we ought to never minimize them, whether they're social issues that have been so much in the news or whether they're readiness issues that are beginning to crop up now, no doubt those are issues that we need to get on and correct and so on. But despite all that, I think uh, we are the envy of the world when it comes to, to our military. Our task, therefore, is so very different than it was in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, to rebuild something that was broken, absolutely broken. Now our task is how we stay the premier force. And that is almost more difficult, because you can get the support of the nation when you can point at something that's as broken as the military was in those days. But in an interwar period, a peaceful period that we're essentially in today, to retain the support of the American people for the resources necessary to keep ours the most modern, the best force. That's a lot more difficult. And yet in the long run, every bit is important. You touched upon the United States becoming the premier military force in the world. Many wonder about our being a global policeman, so to speak. How do you feel about that in, in view of you've, you've gone through Desert Storm, you've worked with uh, General Powell and that. Um, you've also, of course, uh, oversaw 
our involvement in Bosnia. Uh, what sort of responsibility does this country have to the rest of the world in ensuring order? Yeah, I, I think that's an extraordinarily good and, and, and timely question. You have to sort of think your way through uh, how the world has changed. During the Cold War, we relied on our, on our security. Um, by maintaining strong nuclear and conventional forces that would deter the Soviet Union, and deter they did. But that was relatively easy because the threat to our nation, to our worldwide interests, whatever they were, was usually tied to the Soviet Union and their massive military capability. And that's something that can be deterred uh, by those nuclear and, and, and conventional forces we maintain. Look at the threats today, at the, as, as we've now transitioned from, from into this post-Cold War period. The threats that, that, that uh, uh, impact on our worldwide interests and on our interests at home are such things as terrorism, much more sophisticated than before, but nevertheless it's terrorism. Uh, it's uh, deteriorating and failing states in places all over the globe. Uh, it's religious strife, ethnic conflicts that, that threaten to break out into to wars. It's that instability, uncertainty out there. And it's sometimes plain naked aggression like in Iraq. None of those things, none of those that I just mentioned, lend themselves to being deterred by, by those kind of forces that deterred aggression during the Cold War. And as people begin to think their way through, uh, it, it's becoming more and more clear that you have to have a fundamental shift in our, in our security policy. Instead of deterrence, you have to have an engagement in the world, a, a sort of an engagement that shapes the environment out there so that the ethnic strives do not become crises and crises do not become regional wars that invariably draw us in. And because we are now a global nation in a sense that we have global economic interests, political interests, instability almost anywhere impacts on our markets, impacts on our security, that of our friends, allies in one way or the other. And so stability and the lack of conflicts more than ever before anywhere is in our best interest. And because we are the dominant, the most influential nation in the world today, much of that burden of shaping the environment really falls on our shoulders. And that ranges from such things as sending soldiers to Russia so that they would train with Russian soldiers and begin to, to overcome the paranoia and the mistrust that exists between us, to holding exercises somewhere, to dealing with a Rwanda when a humanitarian tragedy overcomes them. Um, and whether that's dealing in Rwanda with providing clean water so you can get handled on, on uh, cholera that was breaking out in the camps, or whether you do or fail to do, as we did, uh, deal with the genocide that was occurring in Rwanda itself. Or look at Haiti. Uh, as we were facing the prospect of Haiti literally moving into Miami, do you do, you do something about this, or do you, do you begin to shape that or, or not? So when you say, are we becoming the policemen of the world? I, I say, no, we're not, and we should not, because the connotation of policemen is different than, than what I think of. What we should become is an active participant in trying to shape the environment so we do not have wars and conflicts. We'll stop for just a second. His battery died, but your shot was OK. So. Are we all right? Yep. Is that pretty much the situation that, that you encountered when you took over as uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? I think so, but I think those were still very much the formative years, uh, formative in the sense that we as a nation had to think our way through and, and, and to find out what our role was. Let me take you back to something uh, we were talking about earlier. The change that occurred at the end of the Cold War, in my mind, was every bit as as traumatic as the change, let's say, at the end of World War II. The great difference was that those who went before us during World War II 
might not have known whether the war would end in 1945 or 44 or 46, but they knew that war was going to come to an end. And there were lots of people thinking about to, how the world needed to be restructured, what institutions we needed in a post-World War II period. Uh, people didn't just end the World War II and say, oops, we've got to think up the United Nations. Think tanks, universities, whatnot, were thinking about the structures we needed. When the Cold War ended, by the way, more new nations were created and more borders changed at the end of the Cold War than did at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't know of a single think tank that in any serious way, I don't know of any university in any serious way, was thinking about the institutions, the structures, the whole relationship between nations that, was, that we needed to understand when, when the Cold War ended. And so it's not surprising that it took us a few years to begin to understand how much the world had really changed and what the role of the United States now as the one remaining superpower would be. Because it is vastly different to deal in a world where you have to measure everything in terms of that competition between you and the other major power than you, when you are the, the only one. The approaches to problems, the institutions that help you, it, all of that has changed. And so, at the time that I first worked for Colin Powell, when, when he was the chairman, when I went to, to NATO, uh, which was the time when, when uh, Bosnia broke out, and we, we started to, to work to get NATO involved in, in that process, uh, and in fact started the first NATO involvement in Bosnia uh, while I was uh, secure. And then when I became chairman, I think during those years is when, when we really begin to, to understand better. And this notion of our security being aided now by active engagement in the world, not as a policeman, but as, as someone, the best word I can use is the, who tries to shape the environment so that our interests are protected. Uh, that's a, it, it occurred during the time that I, that I was chairman. So it was a very, I think, a, a very crucial period, and, but at the same time, an extraordinarily interesting period, because there were some, some very, very good folks in and out of government trying to come to grips with this new period. What philosophy did you take to the job as chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Well, I think my, I can tell you my main concerns as I went. Uh, I thought that probably the most important function of the job of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is to give the best possible military advice to the president, certainly to the Secretary of Defense and to the National Security Council. Um, that I think I always thought is my highest responsibility. Second one is to, to do what a chairman needs to do to ensure that the military remains, in fact, that premier force. And that isn't just worrying, therefore, about today. And while an awful lot of your time in a job is taken up in worrying about the issues that, that you see on the front pages every day, and you, you have to do those right, whether it's a Bosnia, whether that's in a, in a Gulf, whether that's the Taiwan crisis or whatever, each one of those, uh, the nation expects that you do flawlessly. But it's too easy to get lost in a day-to-day in-basket game. You also have to force yourself to reserve enough time to think about 10, 20 years out, and what it is that you need to do today to ensure that 10, 20 years from now, the force is as good as it is today. And this at a time when battles are being fought sure. and watched in the, uh, well, in the living rooms around the United States, for example, in the Gulf War. Um, Many people wondered if we should have gone further into Iraq, and yet when Colin Powell saw what the reaction was to the highway leading out of uh, Kuwait City, they, they shut the operation down. What kind, of, uh, what kind of strictures does that put on you as a military leader when you're under the eye of the media yeah. like that? I, th I think that uh, we first saw it a little bit in Vietnam. Uh, we became very conscious as we were trying to turn the military around, and then obviously the Gulf War is a perfect example. But the way the military does business had to change because of instant communications, because of uh, the ability of the press to instantaneously report uh, 
the most you know, minute incidents that might occur on you. We always had a very, you know, kind of a disciplined but laborious way of passing information from the sergeant to the lieutenant to the captain mm -hmm. and so on. And then passing orders down what, uh, what needed to be done, going back down this chain, if you wish. Uh, which works extraordinarily well when you have the luxury of time on your side. You don't have that at all. When you find out that an incident occurred in a village of Haiti, in Haiti, at the same time that the White House is seeing that on, or, or hearing it. Uh, and so, uh, and they are being asked at the news conference that's coming up in a few minutes to respond to what happened in the village of Guyane when a marine patrol ran into some goons out there. Uh, in the old days, you would have said, wait till we get the reports and have a chance to look at it, and we'll tell you what we're going to do about it. Obviously, that's no longer possible. That might seem like a simple example. But it forces you to do the business of the military very, very different. And you cannot sit and, and somehow hope that the days of old will come back. What you have to do is, is adjust the way you command and control forces, how you react to incidents, how decentralized you now must become in order to work in this world of instantaneous communication. And that has a, has a big impact on a, on a culture, the military culture. And there are today still people who, in, in wearing a uniform who have difficulty coming to grips with that. Uh, can't say that we have all the answers, but we're getting much, much better at this. And, and our commanders who are now senior commanders, who are junior officers in Vietnam, after all, have now had uh, several decades to think this through, to practice it. Uh, and so we're evolving a different way of, of commanding. As you retired in 1997, you've had an opportunity now to look back on your career. What in your what in your time, 39 years in the Army, what gave you the most satisfaction about what you were able to accomplish coming from the ranks of a foot soldier all the way, or artillery man, all the way to the very top? I don't know if I can put my finger on one thing. Clearly, you cannot have been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and had a voice in, in some uh, very important uh, decisions that the country made, whether those are arms control issues or whether they are uh, the crises that we are more familiar with on the screens, but Bosnia and, and whatnot. Uh, that it, it's extraordinarily satisfying when you know that you could have helped in, in the decision that, that, that day in, day out, have a great impact on this nation. But probably on a more personal thing, I remember more, and probably in the years to come, we'll remember more the times that you spend uh, with soldiers. Uh, when you sit by the side of a tank and you talk to them and, and you can help them in, in a way to, to learn their profession, to help them in some personal way that they, that, uh, they might be struggling with. I cannot tell you how satisfying it has been for me over the years uh, and how I cherish those moments that became less and less frequent as I became older, where you could, where you could in fact be with soldiers. They're, they're an amazing, amazing group. I, uh, I told you earlier, and I believe that deeply, that, that we as a military are the envy of the world. And invariably, people assume that we're the envy of the world because we have the best airplanes. Well, we probably do, but that's not why people envy. So the best airplanes, or the, or the best aircraft carriers or tanks. I think they envy us more because we have the best people. Uh, they're just absolutely remarkable. And as chairman, I had the opportunity to, to travel to all corners of the, the world and visit with our troops and visit with, with my counterparts uh, and see their militaries. Um, we are just blessed with having extraordinarily young men and women who ask so little of us. And day in and day out, and then sometimes in the most god-awful places wherever we send them, give us 150 percent and more. You've met a lot of extraordinary men and women, too, in public life. 
Um, let's talk about some of those quickly. Who have been the most impressive to you? You mentioned Ronald Reagan and what he was able to accomplish. Let's, let's start there with another Lincoln Laureate. Um, certainly. But let me back up. I, I sure. certainly don't know all presidents. Right. Uh, but those that I've met, whether that's President Bush or President Clinton, uh, all of them in their own way are extraordinary men. And I am, I'm not one given to hero worship. But there are, there are men who have had a, you know, a, a, an extraordinary impact on, on the nation. Um, in my own profession, um, we have some, some remarkable men. We've had some very recently, and obviously the, those that were, have been in a, in a public eye, like, like Colin Powell or Norm Schwarzkopf, or, or, but there are others as well. And, Quite often, there are people that the public has never heard about. We, when I think of all the the, the, the leaders who had a key hand in changing the military, the military that made Schwarzkopf's and Powell's victories in Desert Storm possible, uh, without taking anything away from those two, uh, it's all the people that labored for for a decade. Uh, unknown to the public, uh, unappreciated, each one working a little piece of this thing to make the military what it, what it eventually became. Um, there are also some foreign leaders that, uh, that are re remarkable men, and whether you talk about Rabin in, in, uh, or whether you talk about Havel in, in, in the Czech Republic and, and others, uh, Chancellor Kohl in, in, in Germany. Uh, and danger always of listing one or two that you leave out some other giants. The problem with being a chairman and coming uh, in contact with presidents and chancellors and uh, military leaders around the world is that, you be, that there's a danger that you become jaded, that you sort of take that for granted. Um, and I remember uh, I, that I tr always tried very hard when going, for instance, to the White House not to allow this to become routine, although I, I guess in attending meetings I was probably there quite often, two or three times a week, but to remember what that place is and how very special it is and how very special the people are who, who work there, or whether you go on a foreign trip or meet in Helsinki and are there when President Clinton and, and President Yeltsin meet and you discuss arms control issues, that you don't, that you, again, that, that you don't all of a sudden think that this is just business as usual, that you recognize the, the very special aspect of what you're doing and how important it is to the nation, how privileged you are to be doing it. At that level, I'd imagine there, there's really no way you would lose a sense of the responsibility and the gravity of the position. No, but, um, uh, you know, the first time you walk through a place like the White House, your heart beats a little faster, and after a while, you have to remind yourself that you're not just in another building, that you're not just talking to another man, that whatever your personal views are, that you're talking to the President of the United States. Some of your colleagues, like Colin Powell and uh, General Schwarzkopf, have been, been courted by politicians, by industry. What, uh, what's ahead for John Shalakashvili? Oh, I don't know. I, um, I, I think I'm still fairly new out of uh, retirement. I am um, now a visiting professor at Stanford, which I enjoy very much. I stay very active still in uh, national security issues, uh, work together with uh, Bill Perry, the former Secretary of Defense. We are both there at Stanford. Um, and uh, are working very actively a, uh, a civilian channel of communications with countries like China and Russia and the Central Asian Republic, Central Eastern Europe, uh, to work some of the issues uh, between them and our nation that are sometimes easier worked in a, in a non-governmental channel than in a governmental channel, uh, whether that's issues to get Taiwan and the mainland to talk to each other, whether those are issues trying to persuade the Duma to ratify Star II and whatnot very important issues and um, not surprising I find that 
while still remaining knowledgeable about government and retaining the context, when you're not encumbered by being inside the government, you can sometimes explore issues uh, in a totally different and a, in a much more open way than you could when, when you were reading from talking points that someone prepared for you. So I, I stay involved in that. And uh, I'm starting to build a house out in Seattle, there in the south of Seattle on Puget Sound. Um, and uh, look forward to organizing my life. It looks like you're continuing that policy of active engagement from the civilian sector. I do. I, I believe in it deeply. I believe in it deeply. And I think businessmen do it as they travel without knowing it. Um, it, it is each one of us in its own way trying to ensure that, that we understand where the, where the points of friction are and try to do something about it so, so it does not lead to conflict. Is that where you feel you can make the best contribution? I think so. I, I, I feel that way, and I, I therefore look forward to the work with, with Stanford and with Bill Perry. I'm just about to the end of my questions. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask one more thing of you, and that is, what were your thoughts upon uh, being notified that uh, you were being nominated as a Lincoln Laureate? All right, I tell you, it, it, it's a very special feeling, and for me, perhaps particularly, I have um, I owe so much to the state of Illinois, certainly the people of Peoria, but to Illinois in a larger sense for, for uh, giving me a springboard to a new life and for giving that to, to my whole family. Uh, and that's not something that you can repay. And then to be honored like this is, it, in a sense, it makes you feel bad because there's one more thing that you cannot repay. Uh, but it's a very, very special honor, and I uh, appreciate that deeply. Well, I was very happy to hear that uh, you were being named. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you, Good. General, and wish you all the best in Thank the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to have to we're gonna have to sit here for just a little while longer. Uh, uh, okay. Why don't you do the intro again? Okay. And then we'll just sit here for some Oh, okay. All right. That's fine. If you've got just sure. a moment. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Ready? General John Shalakashvili is a Peoria native who uh, commanded all NATO forces in Europe and uh, was also the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff until his retirement in 1997. He is talking to us on the occasion of his being named a Lincoln Laureate, and uh, we're certainly pleased that we have this opportunity to talk with the general. That was okay? Yeah. All right. Now. Now all I have to do is wrap up and say, General, thanks very much for taking the time and uh, going into some going into some of this at some length. We do appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Congratulations, and it's Thank been you. wonderful Thank talking you. to you.